Well, it's my great honour and privilege tonight to uh, bring the Word and I'm so excited about this new theme. Tonight is the launch of our church's theme, which is called We The Church. And uh, I'm so, so, so excited about this. When Pastor Mark revealed to us pastoral staff that this was gonna be the first theme in 2016, immediately something resonated in my spirit and I love this theme, We The Church. And if you weren't here this morning, Pastor Brian Maheron, I'm not sure if he's right, there he is right here. Can we give it up for our Dean of our Ministry College? If you weren't here this morning to hear him launch We The Church across our AM services, I encourage you to get the podcast. It was ridiculous. I'm basically just gonna repeat your message. Is that, is that cool? Sick, because he's really smart if you hadn't noticed. So, but if you weren't there this morning, I encourage you, check out the podcast. It's a brilliant message that will do you a whole lot of good. And you know, the reason I love this theme, We The Church, is I love the local church. I believe that the local church is the hope of humanity. Jesus through you and I. You know, we're the only physical representation of Christ's existence now, the local church the hope of the world. It's a beautiful thing, a light, a beacon in a dark place. And uh, you know, for me, I think about when Jesus was on earth, He was a representation of the Father. You know, we read in the Gospel, it talks about, Jesus says, where is it actually? I'll just check here. John chapter 14, verse nine, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? That's, that's boldness, right? There's confidence right there. It's like, you've seen me, you've seen perfection. Check it out, like I'm abiding in it, right? That was, our, that was our Saviour, Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was a physical representation of the Father. And now we get this awesome privileged church, the local church, we the church, to now be now that Jesus has ascended and given us a helper, the Holy Spirit, our great counsellor. He's now allowed us to now be a physical representation of the hope of the world. Now Jesus also in heaven. Isn't that crazy? And I believe that the local church is a beautiful thing a wonderful thing. You know, we the church, we're the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. You know, this is what baffles me even globally because it's not we the church, the, the bodies of Christ. We're not different bodies. The kingdom of God is we're one church, the church. So tonight we're a local church, City Point, but we're a part of a lot of many, many, many other phenomenal local churches in our nation and our nations. We are the church. With the body of Christ. You know, but what baffles me is when I hear people start to diss other churches. And I think, really? Because we're the body. We're, we're the church. We're, we're the family of God. We're the representation of His existence. And you're gonna diss the bride of, of the Christ? Like, I don't know about you, but if I went, before I got married to Jazz, if one of my friends were like having a good old diss about all the negatives about my wife, and there's none, by the way. But if they did, I'd be like, really? Are you gonna say that to me? All the negatives about my bride, you know? Yet sometimes, church, sometimes us as the body of Christ, you know, church isn't just, you know, the build, like we are the church, the people. And so we as the people, the body of Christ can somehow think it's okay to start ragging and dissing on the bride of Christ. You know, sure it might look a little bit different. Every church has different strengths. You know, every church has a different approach. You know, every church has different um, strategies. You know, some churches are really evangelical. You know, some churches have a strength in teaching the Word of God or some churches are big like ourselves. Some are tiny, right? But we're not here to scrutinize the church. We are the church. We're the body of Christ. We're here to celebrate and champion one another. We're, we're together, we're light, you know? And so for me, I think what a, what a missed and sad concept that we would happily rag or use some, you know, sometimes we even get so religious and think it's like justified uh, anger against the church. When Jesus is there listening, saying, you're talking about my bride. You're talking about who I died for. You're talking about who I'm coming back for, my greatest love. And you think that's okay. Crazy, right? So we, the church, this theme across January, February, we'll be talking about our church, City Point Church, a part of the body of Christ. And uh, I'm excited about this theme. I think no greater way than to start our year talking about who we are and our identity in Christ as the church. You know, I start to think about what are some things that the enemy wants to do? (laughs) He's such an idiot, right? Like Satan, I hate him. Don't know if I can say that, but he comes to kill and destroy. Be like alarmed. Don't be fearful, but be aware. The Word of God tells us he comes to rob, kill, destroy. 
He's also on a mission like you and I, and that's to take out the local church. And so when I read the Word of God, I think, God, what's, what's your intention? What are you, how do you see the local church? Give us the same heart that you have, your love, your devotion, your dedication of the local church. And I think, what's Satan's strategy? What's the enemy's strategy for you and I? And I was, if I was to think about one thing that I believe the enemy wants to do to take us out as we the church, something that probably historically we'd see over and over, it's one word and it's called offence. Check this out. In the NIV concordance, it talks about a definition of offence, an act that makes someone angry by what was done. The definition of anger, a strong feeling of displeasure, rage, fury. Let's read together James 1.19. It's on the screen. It talks about anger. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You know, offence or being offended is mentioned 73 times in the Word of God. And I believe that's for a purpose. Yet we can walk through this society seeing a lot of things, maybe church history or the way things have done generations before us and be really easily offended because we've seen once lots of offence. But tonight, I believe the Holy Spirit's gonna speak to hearts here about what it is that we're protecting in this temple, our bodies as a part, as an active member of the body of Christ. And so if you're taking notes here tonight, the title of my message, which I'm really excited about, is called Goodbye Offence, Hello Abundance. Turn with me, Matthew 5. This is gonna be the main passage we read out of tonight. The Sermon of the Mount, amazing part of the Word of God. One day, as he, this is Jesus, saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and they began, he began to teach them. Verse three, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit, wow, the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. It's powerful. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. You know, the amazing thing here, Jesus is talking to the disciples about having a blessed attitude. He's teaching us if who we are to become or who we're gonna be is not just our actions, but it's our attitude. It determines the blessing and the abundance upon our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11, I love this scripture. You know, for those here maybe tonight, maybe you're here, you've never been in a church before. Maybe you've heard about Jesus or maybe you've got a distant relative who's, portrayed a picture of Jesus and you've kind of got this third hand understanding of who He is. This scripture tells us the nature of our amazing God. I love it. Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. You know, the good news tonight, church, is that our God wants a blessed life for you and I. He doesn't want us to abide in strife or anger or jealousy or wrath, but He wants us to abide in Him. And as a result, if our attitudes, if our, the way we conduct our mind and protect our heart is in the right place, He promises blessing upon you and I. We shall inherit the whole earth. How crazy is that? It's crazy for those who have a pure heart. And so I believe tonight that we're gonna look at a few things that we as the church can stay planted in what God has intended for us. Because it's not God's intention that any single one of us here tonight, if this is your local church, City Point, this is your family that you're a part of, it's not God's intention for you to be unplanted and scattered and running around confused and hurt and being a poor representation of what He died for, because He loves you and I. And so us as the body of Christ, we've got this awesome, beautiful opportunity tonight to not abide in offence, but in fact, quite the opposite, live out of abundant blessing that He's called you and I to, which is amazing. And so tonight, if you're here, I wanna let you know one thing. 
that His intentions for you are good, not evil, but good. Proverbs 19, verse 11. I love this scripture. Good sense makes one slow to anger. (laughs) My wife's probably like, preach. Hear it for yourself as well. I'm preaching, babe, I'm preaching. Good sense makes one slow to anger. And it is His glory to overlook offence. Wow. You know, offence is something that you don't actually have to take on yourself. It may come at you. Jesus actually warned the disciples, offence may come, but it doesn't mean that you have to walk in an offence. But it actually, we have the ability by the grace of God to actually push that aside and continue on what His call is for you and I. You know, there's this thing, for those that know me personally, I studied um, organisational psychology at UQ here in Brizzy. And um, we studied a lot of theories. One of is pretty common that a lot of people would know is nature versus nurture. And we did a lot of experiments on developmental psychology, young children, um, where we, it sounds really mean, like, but we basically would put children in a room and give them obstacles or things to do as a research experiment on what things are nature, for example, what's naturally learnt, um, and what things are actually as a result of nurture, being parented, being taught. So you, once we, this sounds so bad, but we put like a banana and when we put like a Kit Kat and then we'd actually wrap the banana in chocolate paste so it smelled like chocolate. I know this sounds brutal, but this was a, a psychological experiment on studying nature versus nurture, what things. So for example, some people that have an accent, you know, studying would that be a result of nature or would that be as a result of nurture? Maybe their surroundings create a new accent, even though the parents like, please don't have that Kiwi accent. We've got some guests here from Majestic Church in New Zealand. Please don't inherit that accent. But if I was to move my child to New Zealand, they'd have the glorious Majestic Church accent, right? And then if, if they were under the age of three or four, they're probably gonna really easily like Pastor Aaron and Becky Lucas, who are doing awesome, by the way, in our City Point campus in America. If you talk to their kids on FaceTime or Skype, you're gonna notice their kids now have an American accent right? So it's kind of, yes, it's, it's cute. Sienna is like a living Britney Spears, I hear. She's like, oh, hey, how are you going? Um, with a microphone, of course. So our future worship leader of City Point. Um, so nature versus nurture. And something that I believe is a part of that is maybe what we actually unaware, unawarely notice that we are being taught things by those around us. So maybe you're here tonight and you don't want to abide an offence, but you find yourself continually tripping over the same hurdle of offence or discouragement or feeling let down or feeling wrong done by, you know. But maybe that's actually out of habit that's come across your life because you had a mum or a father or an uncle that raised you who was extremely easily offended and continually but, you know, bittering and nagging about things of the church or people, you know, that have hurt them and so what starts to happen with this theory of development is that you start to take on the habits of those that are around you, things that you're even unaware of, the theory of nature versus nurture. But I've got good news for you because even though those things may be 50-50, some, some causes of development are nature, another 50% are nurture. But in the things of God, you don't have to worry about how you were nurtured in your previous life, because once you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you now inherit a whole new nature that overcomes your natural nurturing experience, you know? But maybe for some of you, like you and I, I've grown up in church, I've had parents in church, and I've seen offence. I've seen things that people um, struggle to go back to the same church because of someone that's offended them. And I wanna speak to you tonight and say, I'm so sorry on behalf of that church or that person that maybe has wrong done you by, but I wanna let you know, church, that in order for us to step into an abundance this year, to the blessing that God's called you to, we have to acknowledge where the offence is coming from. Because the church is people. If you're gonna go to the gym and potentially get offended, you're gonna potentially walk into a church which is also people and get offended. And I would hate to offend people. I'm, I don't like conflict. My wife would say, you need to get better at conflict resolution and you know, just say it how it is. Don't get worried about people's feelings as much. You know? But honestly, I probably am gonna offend you. I'm so sorry to say that because I'm human. And so for you and I to be offended or walk around and say, 
oh, the church has offended me. No, no, the church hasn't offended you. Chardon has offended you, right? But to, to collate that and say the church, the body of Christ, the body of Christ has offended me and now reject that option for your life, you're no longer gonna abide in what God has called you to do. That's the enemy at work. It's not the Lord. He doesn't want us bound and broken. Just a little personal story. For those that maybe don't know me, I'm really analytical. I studied psych. I love analyzing, breaking things down. In our pastoral meetings, we'll create ideas and teams and themes and I'll be straight to like problem shooting rather than vision and excitement and passion. And I'm like, okay, well, would that really work because of this, right? It's my, it can be a curse, but I believe it's a blessing from God. It's a gift from the, from the God above, right? But in my critical thinking, I first walked through these doors when I was 21 years of age. And uh, I came from an awesome small church and had really intimate worship, I guess you could say, because it was forced to, because there was 30 of us, so it was intimate. And uh, great teaching. I knew everyone in that church building. I was familiar. I felt like I know what it feels like to be we the church. Walking through these enormous doors with enormous lights, smoke machines, big scary guy on a microphone, you know, and I was just so quick to judge open to offense, instantly was like, hmm, not sure what I think about this. Don't like his shoes. I'm not sure if I trust this guy one bit, right? All those worshipers, you know, they seem a bit too happy. Is that real? Is that just hype, right? I was probably the most, you might even be here tonight thinking the same thing about my Nikes, apologies, but I was that person and I walked through these doors and it had nothing to do this, with the state of this amazing church. Nothing it had everything to do with the position of my heart when walking through these doors. And you know what happened after a year of me being in this church? I had a friend here I went to school with, and um, I would kind of do the walk in thing purposely late, miss a few of the hype songs, just do the low key, intimate, what I was used to. Altar call, end of service, I'm out. I was that guy for one year, didn't get activated, didn't serve, didn't make friendships, didn't want a piece of it, but I just felt that God wanted me here, and so I was kind of pushing through. So sad, right? I don't know if someone's here and you feel the same thing. You're not leaning into where God's called you to be. You're not being planted, you know? And I was in that situation. A friend came to me and said, you're not flourishing here, yet God's called you here. Why would God call you to a house to be a part of the family, yet you yourself are not flourishing in this church? And he said, you know what it is? You've got gifts and talents. I still remember, he's probably watching this podcast. It was an amazing moment. I hated you at the time, but I love you now. Ben McChrystal said to me, you have gifts and talents. You're great with people. You have musical gifts. You're doing nothing with it. You're not flourishing. But you know what? It was hard words. He said, it's your fault. It's not the church. It's got nothing to do with the church. Chardon, it's actually your fault. You're holding back the gifts and the talents that God's placed you with to now release to His people and being active in the church. And so I kind of took that slap and was like, stuff you, but okay. So I went with him that Wednesday night, went to his life group, instantly found like five friends. I've got people to actually sit with at church now, you know? Instantly things changed. As soon as I made that decision to hold back the offence, hold back the resentment, hold back the judgment or the pre, you know, disposition of things that weren't even into my knowledge of, I didn't actually understand the running and the leadership of this phenomenal church. Yet you can still walk in here and have preconceived ideas. Yet that's not God's intention for you, young man or woman. This is His body. This is His beautiful church. This is what He's coming back for. And I wanna encourage you tonight as we go through this theme as the start of the church, we the church, you belong here. You have value here. You have something that no one else in this church can contribute other than you. And you know, heaven is actually waiting, expectant, pumped, you know, 5.59 on a Sunday night. Here we go, 6 p.m. City Point's about to start, right? Come on, get activated. Come on, go say hi to someone you don't know. Come on, go to that yes desk and say, all right, I'm gonna give a bit of my time. I'm gonna come early and I'm gonna greet someone with a smile next week because I'm good with people. Because I'm good at approaching maybe the uncomfortable or the introverted, I'm good at that. And I'm gonna contribute that. Heaven is waiting for you to activate the gifts that God placed in you. And that was my personal journey. Crazy, right? Because here I am trying to be an extrovert and be all like, yeah. <laughs> Where's the smoke machine at? Okay. <laughs> Seriously, can we put the smoke machine on? I just can't function without that. It makes me feel like it's, that's a joke. Okay. <laughs> Jesus told the disciples in Luke 17, offenses may come, be aware. 
The craziest thing to me is when people say, I'm offended by the church is not just the offense itself is a really sad thing and it's a life altering thing, I believe it breaks people. But the craziest thing to me when I hear that statement is that you were shocked that you could be offended in a people group. Sometimes we put church in this unrealistic expectation of perfection. God's perfect. And I don't know if you've met me, but I'm not. I don't want to hurt a brother. We're here to edify, encourage, uplift one another, go out of our way for one another. We died with Christ, right? So we live on His behalf now. But there may still come a time where you and I may disagree. But what I'm talking about tonight is how are we gonna respond to that? Are we gonna allow Satan now to allow bitterness to harbour within your heart? Are you now gonna hold a thing called unforgiveness and put it up on a shelf and think it's a barrier when really it's stopping you to step out and you're calling on your life? James 3 verses one to nine, I love this passage. The untamable tongue. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should, come be, should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be drug, judged more strictly. Holla. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. That's specifically talking about pastors and ministers in leadership. I'll repeat it. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Verse three, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses for it to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame on fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is relentless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. Check this out. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. We need God, hey. There can't come a day that we can walk and think that we don't need Him. Every day, I believe we've got to put on the armour of God, protecting ourselves and being aware of what it is that He's given us, what tools can be for good or not for good. Ephesians 4, it's a powerful passage. This is Paul speaking in prison. And this is talking about the church, us here tonight. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. How good's that? Making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one Spirit, just as I've been called to the glorious hope for the future. That's insane, right? I feel like I could get off the platform right now. We've been called to be a body that's intentional to make allowances for one another's faults. The grace of God's been so good to you and I, how could we not abide in it and release that to people around us? You know, maybe you're here tonight and you have been offended, not actually for something that's not justified, it actually to you, it's, it's enormous. And in fact, it is even enormous, even from politics perspective or from the law of the land, You've been wrong, wrong done by. You know, someone's maybe stolen money from you. Someone's maybe physically abused you. You've been through torment and of no fault of your own. And you're here tonight saying, Chardon, you're gonna tell me not to be offended. Do you know what I've been through? It's a little bit crazy. You know, I still believe as hard as what you've gone through and many, many people have gone through and these young girls in Cambodia that we rescue and our She Rescue Home have gone through. If you hear some of the stories of these girls and the torment they've been through, 
the grace of God is still sufficient for them. The grace of God is still sufficient for you. He wants to enable you tonight to let those things go, not harbour unforgiveness. You know, you know that story about unforgiveness? It's like a bottle of poison. You hate someone, but you, you as unforgiveness, you are the one that's drinking the poison and hoping they die, yet they're not even aware you're drinking it. You're smashing that poison down called unforgiveness, saying, yeah, you better, you better, you know, you better, I'm gonna, you better. Meanwhile, they're walking off having a great time and you're drinking poison. That's what unforgiveness is in your heart. And that's not God or heaven's intention for our lives, church. Proverbs 4, verse 20, as the team come, I love this. My son, pay attention to my words and be willing to learn. Open your ears to my sayings. You know what's gonna get real good, right? When it starts with that, like you better listen up, like holla, like right now, incline your ear, this is about to be good. Open your ears to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart for they are life to those who find them and healing and health to all their flesh. Watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flows the spring of life. You know, God has got so much abundance for you and I. In Matthew 5, when we read this passage where it said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I don't know about you, but I wanna see God. In tiring times like right now, chaos right now, people that may hurt you, backstab you, a, a business deal that went sour, right? If there's any time we wanna see God, it's now, amen? And blessed are those with a pure heart, for they see God. And so I studied for just a couple of days this week about the word pure, because I wanna have a pure heart. And the strong concordance, it talked about pure. And it's actually a Greek translation from the word katharos, which is K-A-T-H-E-R-O-S, which means clean, unstained, without mixtures, free from contamination, from which now the word catheter has come from. And a catheter is something that obviously keeps pollution out of certain functions of our body. And so for something to be pure, it's like having a catheter on our heart. It's an intentional decision to make sure we're continually learning how to keep some things our history so that it doesn't affect our destiny. It's something that we withhold with prayer and we wake up in the morning and we start our day saying, God, this is your day. Clean my heart, pure my heart, make sure that there's nothing that not only the enemy, but even man could do against me that allow me, help me to have a catheter that continually cleanse out the rubbish, move on with the good. Someone comes against me, cleanse out the rubbish, Lord God is my prayer. I wanna move on with the good. Cleanse out unforgiveness. Let me move on with what you've called me to do. Let me see people, God, how you see those that you died for. You know that crazy uncle we all have? I've got heaps. I've just got one actually, two. I'm probably gonna be one soon. That crazy uncle, right? We've all got family and we're all different. Like the church, the church, there's so many different people, right? And there's so many different churches that have different approaches, but that doesn't give me the right now to have a a strong go, a strong dig or an anger discussion about my uncle. He's just different to me. For me now to walk around and hold unforgiveness about an uncle who's part of my family, just because he's a little strange or different in my opinion. Do you know that strange uncle Jesus loves him more than we can even fathom. Jesus is so proud of the gifts and talents that He has given your uncle or your part of the family, right? And so we in this beautiful big church with wide open doors that say, all are welcome, you belong here. You know what I think that is? One, it's an example of what heaven's gonna look like because there's gonna be a lot of differences in heaven. Every race, every background, every social status, money in your bank account, their lack of. All that matters is that we have a desire to be affluent in our relationship with Him. Not affluent in the things of the world, not possessions or what we look like or who our click is, but our greatest desire, our greatest success is being affluent in our relationship and pursuit for Him. And so we can come into church and be like, oh, he's a bit old, oh, he's a bit different. Oh, I can smell rum on that guy that I just said hi to in the greet after the worship, right? Who cares? At least he's in the church. He could be anywhere right now in a gutter, 
but he's somehow gotten in the house of God with the family of God, right? And I think there's no better place to be And Pastor Mark says this awesome example of a young guy many years ago that he saw smoking and you know, people in the front of church are like, oh, someone's smoking. Oh no, Pastor Mark's about to see him. Oh no, this is getting really awkward now, you know? The pastor's about to see the smoker. And Pastor Mark's perspective is like, are you kidding? This guy could have been on heroin two weeks ago. This is a miracle. This isn't something to disregard or judge. This guy just having a fag over here, it's okay. He, uh, he's actually on his journey. He's actually received the Holy Spirit two weeks ago, but here you are judging them when really heaven's rejoicing. Heaven and kingdom's perspective is celebrating the victory in this man's life. You know, maybe you're here and you have been offended. You have been hurt. That's not Jesus' intention for your life. And whether that person doesn't even come back to you and apologise, it's time for you to let it go and forgive what was done to you. You know, that person may not even be aware of how they spoke to you or how that made you feel isolated or how you weren't appreciated enough when you spent a lot of time, you know, investing in the youth team, the young adult team, Red Frogs team, you know, our schoolies team. I feel like our schoolies team have every reason to be offended because they spent like 900 hours with no sleep, cleaning up vomit. And I don't know if every team leader appreciated them as much as they'd wanna be, right? Yet we get to be the light of the world We get the privilege to clean up after people who are losing their life, potentially about to lose their eternity in a week's decision called parties. And we get the decision, am I gonna be offended through this act of service or am I gonna see this as a privilege to be a participator in the greatest cause there ever is, the local church. This is actually our greatest privilege. I just wanna read one last thing. If we could stand tonight, that'd be awesome. I so believe that God's tugging on hearts tonight that need to be planted. Not attending church, not visiting multiple churches maybe, but God's calling you to be part of this family, this house. You know, I don't know about you, but I can't just leave my family and go to other Christmases every year. You know, I say, God, where do you want me? You want me at City Point? That really big, shiny, overwhelming church where I know no one and it is really the wrong music style to me. Like I love music, God, come on. You know, I hate Creed, you know, I hate rock. You sure you really want me in that big, Rocky Church, you know, come on God, you know me, you know the desires of my heart. I love soul. I love sweet sound of music. You want me at that rock church? Right, that was was me. And maybe you're here and you're like, you know, is this the church for me, God? Is this, because I don't believe God desires everyone in every church to be unplanted and visiting any church at any time. I'm not saying the other churches in our church um, city and our nation are phenomenal, but I believe God's calling some of us to be planted in His house, roots deep, that when the waves or storms may come, you're still standing because you're planted, not traveling forests, right? And I believe that's actually the Kingdom of God. Some people say to me, oh, I'm just visiting this church because this band, I'm visiting that church because there's this guest speaker and I'm visiting this church because there's a healing evangelist and you know, and I'm very Kingdom of God. But I believe the Kingdom of God is all about the local church. So I'm not against those churches. I'm here to say, you need to stay planted in that church. If that's where God's called you, stay planted. You know, we have young adults come in here on Wednesday nights and we'll often say, because a lot of churches maybe don't have um, such a large young adult community, maybe youth group, but young adults, they struggle. So they come here on Wednesday. We intentionally say, go back to your local church on Sunday, be planted in your church. We're so stoked you're here tonight, but we're not here to pull you out, right? And so God, I believe, called me to this church 10 years ago. And then my natural state, I was like, are you kidding me? This one, right. This is not my desired plan. This is not what I, you know, this is not my flavour, you know, the whole thing. This is not how I jam, God. But I still felt He told me, He told my father as well, that's where you need to be, that's where you need to stay. And so I have no intention of leaving. I wanna raise my kids here. I pray that my kids stay firm, planted here, raise their family here, right? Being planted where God's called you to be. But I believe there's people here tonight and God's tugging on your heart saying, I want you to be a leader upon leaders. I've called you this church to inspire people that don't even yet know Jesus, but are gonna be the next greatest traveling minister, that you're gonna stay planted and you're gonna disciple those under you that you haven't even met yet, that are gonna change history. There's people in this room here tonight that you've been holding unforgiveness and God's saying, you've been set up, tonight's your night. I wanna enable you to let go of those things 
and be everything you've been called to be, we the church. Blessing is coming your way. Breakthrough is coming your way. Let's close our eyes. Lord God.